Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on which time zone you are. On behalf of Genomic Prediction, we want to thank you for joining us today for the webinar Live View PGT Expanded. In this webinar, Dr. Nathan Treff will cover the most recent advances in pre-implantation genetic testing, including the recently introduced PGT for Polygenic Disorders, or PGTP. We are very pleased to say that we have over 250 participants today from 26 different countries. After Dr. Treff's lecture, we will have a Q&A session in which Nathan will address questions from the audience. We therefore encourage you to type your questions at any time using the chat of this GoToWebinar platform. In the eventuality that we run out of time and some questions remain unanswered, we ask you to please email them to us and Nathan will address those questions. The speaker today is Dr. Nathan Treff. He is the co-founder, chief scientific officer, and clinical laboratory director of genomic prediction. Dr. Treff holds a PhD in biochemistry from Washington State University, and he was the director of molecular biology at one of the biggest IVF programs in the United States for 11 years. Nathan has over 100 peer-reviewed publications and is a senior editor of journals such as the Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics and Fertility and Sterility. Once again, we thank you very much for joining us today. Nathan, it's all yours. All right, great. Thanks, Dr. Marin. I uh, appreciate the introduction and uh, thank everyone for attending today. It's, it's nice to actually be giving a lecture. Um, and uh, this first slide, actually, I'm going to remove my mugshot so you can see the slides a little bit better. But this uh, first slide can serve as my disclosure. Uh, as Diego said, I'm a co-founder, CSO, and clinical laboratory director for genomic prediction. And I'm presenting on behalf of Genomic Prediction Clinical Laboratory. The talk today will start out with introducing genomic prediction. I'll review uh, some of the things that we've done with our new platform, LifeView PGT, um, A, S, R, and M, and then get into polygenic risk scoring in the context of PGT. And I'll close with ethics, future directions, and then we'll have a Q&A session. We hope everyone is staying safe during this pandemic. Um, while we haven't converted our laboratory to provide COVID-19 testing, we have, for example, uh, provided our inventory of PPE to the state of New Jersey to help support the frontline healthcare providers. And Towards the end of the talk, I'll show you a little bit about something different we're doing to actually contribute to a better understanding of COVID-19 infection outcomes through genomic prediction. Our leadership team at Genomic Prediction includes our three co-founders, Laurent Tellier, myself, and Stephen Shu. Steve and Laurent have worked together for several years to develop uh, some of the first machine learning algorithms that accurately predict polygenic disease from DNA. We're also fortunate to have Josh Shu as our chief technology officer who came to us from IBM Watson Genomics, and Jennifer Eccles, who's our head of genetic counseling in a pivotal role, uh, plays a pivotal role in our service to uh, clients and patients. I mentioned we're located in New Jersey or in a relatively large biotech center called the Bioscience Center in uh, New Jersey near the Rutgers University campus. Last year, our laboratory received CAP accreditation and uh, we're also CLIA certified as well. I think everyone's aware that PGT is becoming a very common practice in the United States in 2018. 40% of cycles included PGT. So it's a relatively common procedure now, uh, utilized for several different applications. The primary being to look at aneuploidy or count chromosomes in the embryo with PGTA. We also look at monogenic uh, disorders through PGTM and structural rearrangements through PGTSR. <clears throat> 
There are a variety of platforms available for PGT, and I've organized them here according to the amount of, of money that the test actually costs from left to right, decreasing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for example, um, some of these platforms have been validated in certain ways. Um, for example, qPCR has uh, been validated in two randomized clinical trials, um, whereas low-pass whole genome amplification next-gen sequencing failed, essentially, in the STAR trial, and array CGH failed in the ESTEEM trial. SNP array has also been validated in a non-selection, the only published non-selection study to date. We can also organize these platforms according to improved copy number resolution, and we now have a more high throughput SNP array platform available for utilization. It also turns out that this is the only PGT platform currently used in DNA biobank projects, and this is important for our ability to predict polygenic disease risk. Uh, just to, to give you some summary information on the LifeView platform, uh, it is high throughput. Um, you can see the 96 well plate there, which just illustrates the fact that this can be done with liquid handling robots and with 96 samples in parallel. We can look at over 800,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms, which gives high resolution copy number. We can also obtain direct mutation testing, and as I said, it's commonly used in biobanks. And one of the features of this platform is that from one biopsy, we can obtain all four major categories of PGT. We've published validation on over 500 control samples, which I, I summarize here. Uh, for the four categories of PGT, you can see a high level of copy number and genotype concordance. And this also illustrates one of the unique features of the platform that we do in fact have high accuracy for both of these types of analyses. And it's when we combine the two that we actually are able to expand on a lot of aspects of PGT. So to begin to get into that, um, I wanted to go through some of the basics of genotyping uh, data. When we look at a, a specific position in the genome, there might be two different alleles. This could be a single nucleotide polymorphism where you have two um, different alleles A or allele B. And when we look at the signal intensities for those two alleles, we can actually obtain a genotype, one of three genotypes being either homozygous AA, homozygous BB, or heterozygous AB. And it's these heterozygous positions that are informative uh, not only for genotypes, but for copy number. We can look at the ratio of the two alleles, or what's sometimes called the B allele frequency. A one-to-one -one ratio, which is shown here, would indicate you have an equal um, amount of both chromosomes or disomy. When the ratio shifts uh, to a two-to-one ratio, this indicates the presence of trisomy because it, there are three alleles present. And when we have a lack or a loss of heterozygosity, uh, it indicates that there might be a monosomy. So if we look at uh, typical copy number analysis with PGTA, really with PGTA, all we are doing is counting chromosomes, which is shown here. Uh, we have an example where this embryo has a monosomy of chromosome 13 and a trisomy of chromosome 21 based on the copy number. What we have with LifeView is the opportunity to combine both copy number and genotyping, and specifically allele ratios. We've developed a way to look at this using what's called a violin plot for each of the chromosomes. And so, for example, if we look at chromosome 5, most of the data is distributed around the 50-50 ratio. This indicates a 1 to 1 ratio. And disomy for chromosome 5. And you can see this is the pattern for most of the chromosomes. With a monosomy chromosome, as I mentioned, there's loss of heterozygosity, and so you can observe that with the violin plot shown here. Again, there's a lack of data distributed around the 50-50 ratio. And 
Finally, with a trisomy, you see a one to two or two to one ratio um, as shown here for chromosome 21. And so this might actually be useful for a number of reasons and it is uh, quite useful. Uh, for example, here you see a copy number plot that indicates the sample and this particular embryo is normal. When we add the allele ratios, you can see that chromosome seven has this unique pattern indicating loss of heterozygosity and an actual karyotype involving uniparental disomy of chromosome seven. Here's another example of a normal copy number. Uh, and this is a biopsy from an actual embryo which indicated loss of heterozygosity across all chromosomes, indicating either a haploid or a genome-wide unipretal disomy karyotype. And another example, which looks normal on copy number, by allele ratio analysis, we can see a two to one ratio for all the chromosomes indicating a triploid karyotype with uh, triple X. The genotyping is also useful um, in parallel with copy number when applied to PGTSR. This is an example of a reciprocal translocation case where you have one parent that is a band balanced translocation carrier. These are the uh, some of the possible inheritance patterns in embryos. And most laboratories can distinguish between whether or not the embryo is unbalanced by copy number or either normal or, ca or carrier of a balanced translocation. But by having the genotypes in parallel, we can actually distinguish between whether or not the embryo is truly normal or a carrier of a balanced translocation. With respect to PGTSR, the resolution of detecting smaller segments that are imbalanced is also important. We can look at that first in terms of the size of whole chromosomes, which range from 47 million base pairs on chromosome 21 to about 250 on chromosome 1. Now, what we need, though, is resolution for smaller segments. Uh, and this shows the violin plot patterns for disomy, trisomy, and monosomy at various sizes of imbalance. Uh, from 1 to 10 megabases. Most laboratories are able to detect uh, imbalances around 10 megabases. With our platform, we have been able to detect segments as small as 2 megabases. So essentially, we have a higher resolution uh, with LifeView. And I wanted to show quickly an example of a case that we received uh, which was rejected by other laboratories because, in fact, the translocation involved very small segments below the resolution of, of typical methodologies. And when we look at the violin plots, for example, this embryo, um, we looked at both chromosome 3 and chromosome 15, and we developed a violin plot on either side of the breakpoint. The so smaller segments in this example are shown in the middle. And in this example, there were two copies for each of the four segments. In other embryos, we found different patterns. Here, uh, one, two, three, and two copies across the four segments, indicating an imbalance, as well as other patterns in a variety of other embryos. And so we were capable of distinguishing between whether or not the, these embryos were unbalanced and specifically in this case, it turned out embryo one was a carrier of the balanced translocation. With PGTM, uh, the advantage of life view is not only being able to perform linkage universally. So if there is a trio available, you don't really have a long setup phase because it can be used for any mutation using linkage. But if you don't have a trio, one advantage is that we can add in direct mutation testing by combining the SNP array with quantitative real-time PCR. And so we can actually perform PGTM in a lot of cases that other laboratories aren't capable of. So to summarize uh, so far, uh, PGT with LifeView, we've expanded on PGTA by combining copy number and genotypes 
we can detect more abnormalities using this methodology. For PGTSR, the resolution goes beyond next-gen sequencing, and we can distinguish balanced carriers from normal. For PGTM, by combining linkage and direct mutation testing, it can be performed on couples without family members, and it can be performed in cases with risk of recurring de novo mutation. Of course, most of the attention around our company is, is based on the fact that we've also expanded PGT to now include the option for testing embryos for the risk of polygenic disease with, with what we call PGTP. And this is not necessarily a new concept. In 1996, Shulman and Edwards described the concept of um, human traits being highly polygenic and that we may possibly analyze a large number of genes and embryos in the near future. Uh, while it, it might not have been as near as they had anticipated, it is now here um, and that we have developed the ability to do this for the first time in human embryos. To provide some background, um, I, I know we're all familiar with PGTM, which is testing a single locus in the genome, for example, the BRCA1 uh, gene to look for risk of breast cancer. Um, and so again, that's a single loci. On the right, you can see the loci used in our breast cancer polygenic risk uh, predictor. So several loci around the genome and, and some of those loci are weighted differently than others. It's also important, I, I included this example because um, this is a situation where PGTM is performed for risk reduction. We know that uh, not all BRCA1 mutation carriers develop breast cancer, and not all people without a BRCA1 mutation uh, do not develop uh, breast cancer. So this is a, a test which um, essentially reduces the risk of adult onset disease, and this is the exact application of uh, polygenic testing. One other big difference, though, is that monogenic disease accounts for about 1% to 2% of, of um, prevalence of disease in the population, whereas polygenic is uh, near or probably even greater than 30% of the population. And that's illustrated here by the World Health Organization, where you can see that several polygenic diseases are among the most common causes of death. And, and so these include heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. It also turns out that infertility itself might be a marker of polygenic disease risk. Uh, so individuals with infertility have um, potentially a higher risk of cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. The reason that we uh, can start to evaluate um, polygenic disease risk is the availability of um, population level uh, data sets and the power of population level genetics, which is illustrated here in a study that was done several years ago, where you can see the ability to predict where a person comes from based solely on their DNA. And this was actually done with a relatively simple algorithm, principal component analysis, which we've improved upon dramatically over, over several years. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Again, uh, the reason we can start doing that, this is the availability of population level biobanks that have uh, DNA uh, genotypes, genome-wide genotypes available along with uh, population phenotypes so that we can, again, build predictors. The way that this is done is essentially we take a large training set like from a biobank um, and we apply what's shown here, which is a machine learning algorithm. So you show the machine cases and controls, it builds a predictor. You then evaluate the predictor in a set of data that was left out from the, the training set. And then finally, you apply it to a second data set to validate the utility of the predictor. This has been done for several diseases, including in this study from our group. Uh, 
looking at over uh, looking at 16 complex disease risks. And the ones shown here are available for testing in the pre-implantation embryo currently. Other groups have replicated this work. And uh, for example, this uh, particular study points out that polygenic scores for common diseases identify individuals with risk equivalent to monogenic mutations. Another way to look at this is that uh, it's, it's actually shown here where you can uh, categorize individuals based on uh, where they fall in the, in the distribution of risk. So for example, for coronary artery disease in men, those individuals in the top 3% of genetic risk obviously have a much higher uh, incidence of disease than those individuals in the average risk range or in the bottom 3% range. And so the same is true in this uh, graph for breast cancer in women. And so something similar can be done in the embryo where you can identify embryos in the top, say two or 3% as being high risk and those outside that range, not in the top 3%, having a normal risk of, of disease. This uh, uh, was um, recently reported on in The Economist, and they pointed out that genomic prediction is now able to offer IVF couples polygenic risk scores for each embryo for a variety of diseases. And we've spent some time demonstrating that KGTP works or the clinical utility um, and, and this is something people have, uh, they in general wonder, you know, how do we know if it works? And it involves two uh, steps. The first is that we've shown that DNA from an embryo gives equivalent accuracy to the results we obtained from an adult. And so what that means is that whatever performance we see in adults can be uh, expected in the embryo. We have equivalent genotyping accuracy. It's the genotypes that we're actually using to make predictions. And so we can use adults to model what we have in terms of performance with embryo selection. And to do that, what, what we do is the, the second step to evaluate performance in adult siblings with known disease status. First, we blind the individual's uh, phenotypes or their disease status. We can perform random selection of one of the siblings, and then also uh, perform genomic or polygenic risk-based selection of one of the siblings. After we've conducted both sets of selection, you can unblind the phenotypes and compare the two groups for prevalence of disease. And so, for example, that's what we did here with uh, 2,601 uh, siblings with uh, known type 1 diabetes status. And blue, you see what, what uh, random selection produced in terms of disease prevalence. And in orange, uh, the polygenic risk score selection. In each uh, of the number of siblings available, two to five, you see a significant reduction in risk through genetic selection, with only two siblings, a 45% reduction. And then when you have five siblings to choose from, a 72% reduction. So this demonstrates a pretty clear clinical utility to do genetic-based selection to reduce risk of a complex disease like type 1 diabetes. And it's very similar to an application of, that you might uh, see with PGTM and that we modeled it in families where they had an affected uh, sibling. We actually had a case uh, come to genomic prediction where this, this was the situation. The pedigree is shown here uh, for a family that had a history of both type 1 diabetes and breast cancer. And you can see they had uh, one child with diabetes. The IVF cycle produced four embryos for evaluation, two of which were identified as having a high risk of type 1 diabetes, and the other two were found to have a normal risk of type 1 diabetes and uh, breast cancer. Uh, 
So this particular model is relevant to situations where there is a family history. And uh, of course, that's probably where a lot of interest will come from. If, if uh, an IVF couple has a, a known history of a disease, they would more likely be interested in polygenic testing for those diseases in their embryos. But we also wanted to model uh, outcomes when there's no known family history. So essentially a more healthy population to begin with. And that's what we've done here with over 11,000 sibling pairs from the UK Biobank. Uh, and for all of these diseases with what we call a genomic index selection, you can see a significant reduction in the uh, risk of a disease, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, coronary artery disease, heart attack, and type 1 and type 2 diabetes, all significantly reduced with genetic selection compared to random selection. And this applies uh, specifically to a situation where there are only two siblings to choose from. And again, as I said, when there's no known family history, so to a relatively healthy population to begin with. And so for, for all of our clients that are on the webinar, um, I wanted to go through something that is available to patients using LifeView for, for other types of PGT. So this is an example when a patient might be using PGTA. They first identify that they have two euploid embryos to choose from. And then the question is, how do they decide which embryo to select? And they might be interested in looking at polygenic disease risks. All they would do then is to submit uh, saliva samples to our laboratory. We would then be able to obtain the PGTP results for those euploid embryos. And then they could choose one based on the genomic index score. Of course, we might have a situation where all of the embryos are identified as high risk. And this doesn't necessarily mean the patient would elect to discard both of those embryos. But having additional information on disease risk can be useful. For example, with diabetes, you might uh, monitor more closely new methods for intervening during, for example, the honeymoon phase that could prevent full-blown diabetes. So who should consider LifeU for PGTP? Um, we think patients using oocyte donation um, are are good candidates because they'll probably produce many euploid embryos for selection. Um, really, patients using PGT uh, can add PGTP with LifeView. And so we think that this is an important option to provide uh, patients. And particularly, uh, when you have a couple come in and they have a history of one of these diseases, which is likely to be true for most patients. Diabetes, cancer, heart disease are relatively common. Um, and so it, I think it's important that we offer this opportunity to those individuals as well. And it turns out that embryos from uh, couples that have uh, stronger family history in, in this graph, what we see is the genomic index or embryo disease risk scores for embryos with a first degree affected family history. The scores are significantly higher than embryos derived from patients with no known family history. I mentioned this earlier, but genetic counseling is, is a critical part of our service. It's mandatory with all PGTP. It's included with all of our life view tests and conducted by our head of genetic counseling, Jen Eccles, who is going to join us at the end for our Q&A session today. A lot of people are interested in, in the ethics, uh, including the media. Uh, several articles have appeared in, in various outlets. If you're interested in reading those, you can go to our website news section and, and see what people have been writing. Most of the media has really sensationalized what we're doing and um, talked about designer baby applications, which interestingly, another group modeled uh, and found that it was not effective. So um, this is actually relatively good news that what most of the media is concerned about might not actually work. So they modeled improving uh, traits such as intelligence or height using embryo selection. <clears throat> 
some outlets took this to suggest that it actually indicates polygenic risk scoring doesn't work in general for embryo testing. But the authors themselves point out that their study is really not applicable to the utility of embryo screening for disease risk reduction, which is what we're doing at Genomic Prediction. The American Society for Reproductive Medicine uh, has um, argued that for reproductive liberty uh, purposes, it is ethically allowable for PGT for adult onset conditions of lesser severity or penetrance. So this is really stating that it's up to the patient to decide whether or not they want to utilize PGT to reduce risk of adult onset disease. And we already commonly use PGTM for risk reduction. Several examples are shown here. I already talked about BRCA mutations, which are low to moderate cancer predisposition genes. Other examples include non-classical CAH, hemochromatosis, biotinidase deficiency, and uh, some genes involved in Alzheimer's disease. There's also a statement on sex selection and and the ASRM uh, says that patients have the right to the information about an embryo sex, as well as the right to request not to be given this information. Again, it's up to the patient to decide. And it turns out to be relatively common in practice in PGTA. For example, in the United States, a, a relatively large program, when looking at about 1,500 single embryo transfers, almost half the transfers were done based on choosing an embryo uh, for its sex, so essentially genetics, um, as opposed to embryo morphology. Uh, and this is an important study because it also shows that despite choosing an embryo for a reason other than morphology, you still get equivalent implantation rates. Uh, so it, it applies to the concept of polygenic testing when you have two available embryos in that uh, choosing an embryo based on a better genomic index score would not necessarily change the implantation rate observed. Genomic prediction's also been in uh, some recent public policy pieces. Dominic Cummings, for example, wrote a blog on genomic prediction with the concept of free universal, free universal SNP genetic sequencing to really Im improve the efficiency of healthcare. In, in the UK and, and improve how we manage health across the world. The European Commission also described uh, what genomic prediction itself is doing and pointed out that we need to um, spend some more time discussing implications for this new uh, capability of testing embryos for polygenic risk scoring. In the beginning, I mentioned something different that we're doing at Genomic Prediction and, and um, with respect to COVID-19, the UK Biobank is now making data available on individuals that, uh, that had been infected with COVID-19. And we know from other studies that underlying conditions such as diabetes and hypertension have different outcomes compared to the general population. And these are diseases that can be predicted with polygenic risk scoring. So there may be an opportunity for genomic prediction to help manage healthcare in situations where patients are, have different underlying uh, conditions. We're also involved in several ongoing research projects. The Get Set trial is a randomized clinical trial um, with, with several um, different outcomes uh, being measured. We also have a, an observational trial where patients can utilize PGT and then uh, elect to or elect not to obtain polygenic risk scoring in their embryos. And so we're going to be monitoring what um, patients uh, decide and, and why they decide to use or not to use polygenic risk scoring. We also have a, an adult test uh, called M2 test. This looks at the index in five gene and carriers of N2 haplotype have a higher risk of miscarriage and there are ways to alleviate that, for example, through low molecular weight heparin treatment, as well as what we've developed uh, at Genomic Prediction, which is PGT for this particular haplotype. And our work we intend to uh, present at several upcoming meetings, 
I wanted to include a list of our publications so that uh, people might look them up if you're interested in more information. Of course, we, we do plan to expand our uh, ability to predict in uh, more populations and for more diseases using newly developed uh, biobanks throughout the world. We're also benefiting from uh, significant growth in research and publication around polygenic risk scoring. Uh, oh, and to conclude uh, about, about uh, what I've presented, LifeView expands conventional methods of PGTA, MNSR, polygenic risk scoring in embryos is as accurate as adults. Polygenic risk scoring based sibling selection demonstrates clinical utility of PGTP. PGTP is ethically acceptable for reasons of reproductive liberty. liberty. And our future work, as I said, is in expanding predictors to more populations and diseases. I'd like to thank uh, all of our clinical partners throughout the world, as well, well as several of our testing partners for their support. And finally, everyone at Genomic Prediction, which I have a, the privilege of working with. You can imagine that all of, all of us at Genomic Prediction have to multitask to uh, develop this uh, company to, and, and we have done so to this point, which I'm really proud of the work uh, that we've all done together. So this is what we look like on, on Google Hangout, which I'm sure we're all doing quite a bit of. And then this is what we look like on Slack, where we do a lot of our communication. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions that don't get answered during, during our Q&A session. My email is nathan at genomicprediction.com. And finally, I'll thank all of our participants throughout the world and, and um, uh, thank you for your attention. Let's uh, get started with the Q&A. Thank you, Nathan, for your talk. Um, there you are. So we're going to proceed with the Q&A session. Um, before we start, I would like to introduce to you uh, Jennifer Eccles. Jen, if you could, uh, there your video is. So Jennifer Eccles is the head of genetic counseling and clinical content at Genomic Prediction. Jennifer is a licensed certified genetic counselor by the American Board of Genetic Counseling with over 20 years of experience in reproductive clinical genetics. Jen also has a solid record of scientific literature and has held position of senior genetic counselor and clinical science liaison in major programs of clinical genetic testing. So welcome, Jen. Thank Jen you. So there are several questions that were asked before the webinar, um, during the webinar, and there are some asked right now. So we're gonna start maybe with the ones that um, people sent before the webinar. And one question that was repeated, Nathan, was if the Live View platform of PGT has or includes non-invasive uh, comprehensive chromosome screening. Yeah, so, um... Non-invasive is, is not really a platform, but a sample type to begin with. Um, and it's not something that we um, are, are presenting today, but of course it's of interest to determine whether or not um, culture media can be used as a source of material to get accurate uh, copy number and genotyping, which is, is what um, we've combined to develop the LifeView platform. So, it's something we're interested in, but um, today we haven't presented, and it's certainly not uh, something we offer clinically. I think in general, the evidence for whether or not uh, non-invasive testing is um, valid um, remains to be determined. Perfect. So um, the next question is, is this platform, uh, LifeView, compatible with next generation sequencing, or is it only for SNP array high throughput? Well, I think we, um, and what I've tried to show is, is that, um, that really uh, next-gen sequencing is obsolete with respect to the things that we've been able to expand uh, beyond what next-gen sequencing can actually accomplish. And um, a lot of that has to do with the ability to obtain 800,000 uh, genotypes in the embryo 
accurately in parallel with all of the copy number analyses that I, I've shown. Um, so it would really be downgrading uh, the method to uh, attempt to use it with next-gen sequencing. So another question that was repeated um, almost three times is how do you select for the diseases that are tested for PGTP when you provide an embryo report? Um, yeah, actually, Jenna, I wonder if you wanted to jump in and, and talk about um, sort of the strategy we have for including things on our panel. Obviously, the main criteria is that it's considered a disease as opposed to a trait. Um, is that right. something you'd want to talk sure. about? Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, part of what we want to do is make the panel usable and include conditions that have an impact on quality of life and are diseases that are significant. So some of the conditions that are currently included on the panel include certain cancers like uh, breast cancer, um, testicular cancer, prostate cancer, certain types of um, skin cancers, um, cardiac diseases, and things of that nature, type one and type two diabetes. Um, and so uh, the, the question is, is can't, do we have a validated way of screening for these conditions? And are these conditions Conditions, conditions that are um, uh, significant enough to be included on the panel, and that's and that's part of what uh, the the testing now um, is part of what we're trying to accomplish. And we're constantly looking at different diseases and trying to add different diseases and make the panel um, even stronger and stronger the more data that we have. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point too. I think. A lot of it is dependent on the amount of data we have to build a predictor. And it, I think in general, it turns out that, um, you know, the things that we have enough data for are generally what are more common and, and so potentially more important for us to be able to test for. Great. Um, so there is a question regarding the live view for um, structural arrangements. Uh, the question is, is a resolution to megabases and uh, do you need two biopsies to make um, to perform PGTM cases, for example, if they want to do PGTA or M in parallel? Right. I, I maybe that was a question before the talk, but um, what what I showed is that from one biopsy you uh, can obtain all four tests: A, M, S, R, and P. The two megabase resolution is um, actually. Uh, higher than what we can accomplish with PGTSR. It turns out that you can, with the right uh, set of samples, um, use entirely just genotypes to predict the inheritance pattern in the embryos. So you don't actually need to ob observe copy number variation. But even something smaller than two megabases can be predicted using genotypes nearby the breakpoints. <laughs> So there is a question about the PGTP platform. Um, so for the PGTP service, is there a complete or comprehensive analysis of all the polygenic disease, um, diseases that you test for? So I believe this goes maybe directed to uh, the index that you mentioned. Um, maybe I'm not sure I understand exactly uh, the question, but do we uh, systematically validate each of our predictors, um, and and of course, yes, we do. I, I briefly showed the strategy of having a training set to develop a predictor. It's tested on out of sample validation within the original data set, so samples left out from um, from the training are then tested, and then subsequently validated uh, whenever possible, obviously on a second data set. So for example, with uh, type 1 diabetes, you use the majority of the UK Biobank uh, and show the, the machine cases and controls, and you test performance of the predictor that's developed on samples left out from the UK Biobank. Uh, and then finally, we could test performance on a, a second data set, which was the T1 uh, DBase data set. 
Um, and so we, we go through that type of uh, strategy for all of the diseases that we have available for testing in, in the embryo. So we have a question that was repeated um, and it's mostly a genetic counseling question, I would assume. It is when there are embryos that are flagged as high risk for certain disease, is the indication not to transfer? No, that's a great question. That's a very important question. So the goal of the testing is to help uh, couples and their physician you know, order and prioritize which embryos to transfer. But based on the, the data, we're never going to say, and we were very clear in the beginning that we did not want to put recommendations for or against transfer based solely on the PGTP information alone. Because the PGTP information is a screening tool, it's not a diagnostic test. And even an embryo that has an increased risk for one of these conditions, uh, the, the overall risk may still be low. It just may be much higher compared to the other embryos. So this should be used as a way of triaging samples, but we will never put on the uh, a recommendation for a couple not to transfer an embryo based on the information. It's up to them to use that information how they wish um, and to organize samples. Yeah, Jen, I think, um, you know, we've talked a lot about this and um, we sometimes refer to, to um, what's done with PGTM. Um, I mentioned a, a few situations where it's more of a risk reduction tool. And so I think people are used to with PGTM, like, you know, getting a result that says affected or unaffected right. or carrier, but it's pretty common for PGTM to be used um, and, and embryos are not reported as affected, right? It's, it's a little different Absolutely. classification and maybe you could Absolutely. talk about, about that. Yeah, so so it, it, PGTP testing for me is very similar in, in many respects to some of the testing we're already doing under the umbrella of monogenic testing. So for example, um, we receive lots and lots of requests for testing for conditions that are very mild in nature, have reduced penetrance, and very variable expressivity. So um, if you've ever referred a patient for non-classic CAH that falls in that category, uh, biotinidase deficiency, hereditary hemochromatosis, um, carrier status for um, Fanconi anemia or Bloom syndrome, which, you know, when there are two copies of genes, uh, it creates a very severe condition. But we receive requests for carrier status because carrier status confirms a somewhat increased risk of cancer. So all of those types of requests under the umbrella of monogenic testing are very similar to the types of things that we're trying to accomplish also with polygenic testing. It's a way for patients to gather information to see if an embryo has a higher chance of a particular condition condition so that they can order their samples. And so for those diseases too, we don't make recommendations for or against transfer based on whether there are, for example, two uh, homozygous for non-classic CH or homozygous for hereditary hemochromatosis. The information is there for patients to use again to triage their samples. So this, this type of polygenic testing really does, uh, you know, um, weave in very closely to what we're already doing for those types of conditions. So we have um, still more time. Um, so there is one question regarding uh, the LiveView platform. Can you please address mosaicism, please? And what is the frequency in your reports? Yeah, I equate that question to what is our error rate? Uh, so essentially, um, when people are reporting mosaicism, you can equate that to what the error rate in the method is. Essentially, they don't know whether it's aneuploid or euploid, it's somewhere in between, and people are now classifying those things as mosaic, as, opposing, as opposed to acknowledging that uh, the, the results were um, too noisy to make a, a definitive diagnosis. Um, and we have done studies, you can look in, in our original validation paper where we've tested uh, the method with mixtures of euploid and aneuploid cells. And we've looked at the performance in different levels of aneuploidy uh, to, to define sensitivity and specificity of, of the methodology. 
We do not, though, report whether or not an embryo is mosaic based on observations made from a single biopsy, which I think is inappropriate. Very important. So we have um, another question. Do you accept all patients? How do you evaluate patients with ancestry where the data banks don't have much data on? Do you reject the case in these instances? Good question. Um, so right now, uh, for polygenic testing, um, the data we have was validated on the UK Biobank, which contains uh, mostly individuals of Caucasian ancestry. So the full panel of conditions that we currently have now are validated in individuals of Caucasian ancestry. We have a smaller panel that we validated on individuals of Asian ancestry. And that's part of the work that we're doing right now is to continue validating our data amongst uh, broader ethnicities so that we can continue to add conditions and diseases, not just uh, for individuals of, from one ethnicity, but for individuals eventually from every single ethnicity. But that does make a difference, and ethnic background certainly does make a difference in terms of the, the ability for us to uh, offer uh, a complete panel or only certain conditions at this point in time. Perfect. So we have one that was asked about the live view platform, the copy number. It says, can your platform report polyploid or balanced translocation, which I think you went through it, but uh, if you could also refresh that. Yeah, again, maybe that was a question ahead of the presentation, but um, yeah, the, the uh, methodology for PGTSR allows you to distinguish between whether or not an embryo is a carrier of a balanced translocation or truly normal. Uh, and what was the other question, Diego? Um, it was about polyploidy and balance or unbalanced. Um, polyploidy, you... right. Yeah, so the allele ratios allow you to uh, distinguish between an embryo that's euploid and, for example, either haploid or triploid. Um, and depending on the origin of tetraploidy, that can also be uh, detected as well. Okay. So we have another question about the turnaround time of the test. How does it vary? Um, the turnaround time doesn't really vary. Uh, what, what we offer now is a maximum of 14 days from the time we receive biopsies. Okay. And then we have another question. I believe this is from international guests. Um, do you provide service to other countries? And if so, um, who to contact? That would be the question, actually. Yeah, actually, if you go to the website listed here, pgt-p.com, there's a way to navigate to becoming a provider. But um, I, I'd encourage anyone that's interested to email me at nathan at genomicprediction.com. We do offer service uh, throughout the world. Um, you may have seen in, in one of the pre previous slides, several countries outside the United States are able to utilize our services. Perfect. And then to close, uh, because we're running out of time, um, is this test available in adults or do you plan to develop it? Not currently available in adults, but yes, we do plan to develop something and it might, um, it might uh, be a little bit unusual application. I, I think, you know, Everyone is familiar with 23andMe being uh, involved in polygenic risk scoring for type 2 diabetes. Um, it's, it's a little bit uh, complicated to navigate, but there is utility in uh, developing adult testing. And, and ideally for us, it would be a way for patients to determine um, you know, to what extent they would benefit from IVF and PGT for polygenic risk reduction. Perfect. And um, before closing, there was a question that just popped up. Uh, is this test also indicated or indicated for people who do not, who are not fertile? Well, I think, Jen, we've had people interested in, who haven't necessarily had infertility. And I, I think that's the case for a lot of PGT cases, PGTM, PGTSR, they're not necessarily infertile, but we have an, uh, another reason to um, utilize IVF and PGT. So it isn't that um, we haven't allowed people to do that. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's certainly a, an option for patients or, or for people with out infertility to consider. And it probably depends a lot on how important um, these diseases are to their family. You know, um, and, and I talked about reproductive liberty. Um, I think you'll find that different people have uh, different experience with uh, diseases. You know, a lot of times people argue, well, you know, you can live with diabetes just fine. Uh, but then you find families who've had uh, family members die from uh, a disease like diabetes, and so it might be more important to them. So it isn't that we don't allow people to do it, and I think there is interest from people without infertility based on their personal experiences with, with these diseases. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I don't think we can underestimate the sort of psychological piece of the decision-making and that um, we certainly have had interest um, from couples who are already going through the PGT process and are interested in polygenic testing because they're couples who are very interested in gathering information. And I, I call them the information gatherers, the people who really wanna test for as many things as possible. Um, but if there were a couple who were not necessarily undergoing IVF and were interested in this type of testing, if there was a reason for them uh, you know, to want to inquire about it and, and discuss it and go through the process of IVF, then certainly, again, the, the reproductive freedom piece means that, you know, as far as we're concerned, that they certainly, you know, can certainly do that and have the ability to do that. You know, right now, we're getting the majority of inquiries for PGTP testing, either from couples who already have a child with one of these conditions, typically type 1 diabetes, since that's a condition that usually presents uh, when an individual is, is younger. And then the other group of people are the people who are very information oriented. Um, and that's what we're seeing right now. And that may change over time as this testing becomes more and more commonplace. And uh, before we close, there are two questions that I think are important to address and it's getting exciting in this Q&A session. Given those who believe in patient liberty, as does ASRM, how is PGTP being perceived in other regulatory organizations? Well, I, I, I use the example of the European Commission. Um, and I, th I think it's uh, something very new to a lot of these organizations. So they don't necessarily, necessarily know how to handle um, this. And I, I think there's a big uh, learning curve that hopefully we'll get through soon. Um, and it, it really is dependent on uh, education and um, more and more research, which we continue to do, and hopefully will uh, help um, in in some of the these regulatory bodies with regard to um, how to manage this new capability. And um, in closing, we have: Is there the possibility for voluntary follow-up with future children? Yeah, I think that's been a challenge in general with IVF um, to be able to get uh, patients to agree to having their children followed long term because they have a, a desire not to have their children treated differently from others. So that's a challenging thing to address. Um, and uh, we, we currently don't have a system in place really uh, for, for most of the um, clinical practice of IVF and PGT. So to think that it might be available for PGTP, I think depends on not just what we're doing, but um, the, the general practice of, of uh, reproductive medicine. Great, perfect. So uh, Jen and Nathan, I don't know if you have some final remarks before we close the session. No, thanks Diego. Thank perfect. you. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And again, if you have questions, you can send them in private to Dr. Trepp and he will address them. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, bye.